Hi, my name is Edison McDonald, and I'm so glad to be here today with y'all. Um, I am the executive director for the Ark of Nebraska, um, and I also have uh, the pleasure of a couple other hats. Uh, I'm also the director of government relations and development for uh, a small uh, renewable energy company, um, and then have my own company, Elmway Consulting. Um, and uh, as of December 14th, we'll have a new book called So in the Seas of Justice. Today, this is my assistant, Ellie. She will occasionally pipe in with some extra fun little comments. Um, and yeah, with that, I want to hop over to my PowerPoint. Whoops. Full screen share. And we will get rolling. So today I want to talk about membership organizations in the 21st century. We are seeing a tremendous <laughs> shift societally in terms of how our organizations operate. And unless we're really ready for that shift and working through it, uh, we're, we're not going to survive. We need to make sure that our nonprofits, that our advocacy groups are ready to really take that next step. And I think there are a great many that really aren't. Uh, so I talked a little bit about me. Um, I really, at my base level, believe in making sure that we build up community and helping to engage people to create the change that they want to see. Uh, and that doesn't matter whether it's uh, working with churches or nonprofits or private corporations or in government. I think there are pathways forward to, to do that in all sorts of ways. So today I wanna to talk to you about ways to help you increase your membership, reach younger members, increase funding streams, grow your reach, and generally make your life easier. Um, I have two pictures here. Uh, the, the first one is of some really big old timers. Uh, for those of you who know the disability movement at all, you know Wolf Wolfensberger uh, was kind of the ideological founder of the concept of community-based services and really making sure that people with disabilities were able to live in the community. Uh, he was really at the forefront, as was the organization that I now work for, the ARC of Nebraska, at working to lead the deinstitutionalization movement. On the right-hand side, you have a group of young moms and their kids who uh, have been instrumental in creating some change here in Nebraska. And, you know, I think it just, it shows there's a very different world now and different folks who are going to be advocating, lifting their voices and organizing in new ways. So the question, uh, nonprofits, churches, political parties, membership organizations are all decreasing in membership. They're all struggling to figure out how do we go and make sure that we're able to survive and grow in new situations with new people who have new needs. It's so important because really, as to Tocqueville says, uh, that membership groups and uh, community organizations are vital to creating civic and community change. But I always get this question, and I'll tell you, my, my first political gig was interning for a state senator when I was 13. Um, I ran our Young Dems, Boy Scouts youth group, and I always hear from these older folks who are engaged in those organizations, how do we get the young people? How do we go and get people engaged? How do we get new members? Um, and I think it really does take kind of a transformational view about how you want to approach things. So a bit about the outline and goals, we're going to investigate some issues, review two experiments, dig into tactics and data, review some other tools, um, and then take some time for questions and comments. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to shoot me an email or uh, give me a call or check out my book uh, next week, Sowing the Seeds of Change, an organizer's handbook. So the issue, membership organizations are failing. Rotary's down 20%, JC's are down 64%, Mason's are down 76%. And that decline has been happening for a long time. And it's going to keep happening. So how do we deal with that? And especially in the face of COVID, 
we've seen some changes that were happening, like we were shifting towards a digital world regardless, but we've seen a tremendous spike where all of a sudden that technological transformation that was supposed to happen over a much longer period, over maybe decades, instead happened in about two months. So the problems are that we have a changing community, increase on limits on time, uh, and a technologically evolving community. Uh, that limits on time, I mean, I cannot tell you how many times I have, uh, especially since I work for a very family-centered organization, so many parents uh, who are dealing with just constant issues. They are pulled in every direction, and it's every day, every hour, whether it's you know, going to uh, sports or going and making sure that their kid gets to music practice uh, or helping their kids with the excessive hours of homework. Um, and that technological evolution has really created just so many challenges, but also so many opportunities. So starting off, I'm going to talk a bit about the organization I serve, the ARC in Nebraska. When I came in four years ago, here are our demographics much older, uh, significantly uh, more female-led organization. Uh, we went from having an average age in the last four years of over 66 down to around 40 um, and have really helped to significantly shift uh, our audience, the people that we're serving and making sure that we are bringing in those new members. Um, one of the big ways that we've done this is really focusing on uh, a key campaign for us and the list. Uh, so I think generally people think that people with disabilities get the services that they need, but that's not true. Um, in almost every state in the nation, there is a waiting list for any sort of developmental disability services that is going to be on average somewhere between five and 10 years. Here in Nebraska, ours right now is about six to eight. Uh, and we're trying to figure out how do we deal with that? How do we make sure that families get the services that they need when they need them? So we focused on a few key pieces. One, we started a big petition campaign to really start the energy movement and say that, you know, we've seen this wait year after year after year, decade after decade. And we said, you know what, no more. We're going to start really taking a charge to end this. Uh, we focused on using tools that allowed us to use automated follow-up, uh, create funnels to really make sure that we were helping people to grow their engagement and education. Education needs to be at the core of everything that we do to make sure that our movements are truly sustainable. So as we talk about sustainable movements, uh, I want to start off about talking about a few tactics uh, and kind of within a structure of levels of engagement. Um, for those of you who are familiar with uh, the political science literature, Green and Gerber are very prevalent. They've done a lot of the academic research about the underpinnings of how campaigns work, what is most effective, um, and, and how to make sure you're really connecting with people. So they talk about levels of engagement and we've got a period pyramid here and you've got kind of the highest levels, which are going to be, you know, those emails, social media. It's great. It's fun to be able to shoot off an email to 12,000 people like that. Um, but it's not a super strong connection. Uh, then you've got a little bit more directly sort of connecting tools like direct mail. It's a little bit better texting you start to get a lot better and you can hit big audiences pretty quickly and have that back and forth communication um, and all of a sudden you can have one person hitting a huge group phone calls where you know you start to really get some of that personal interaction uh, and then of course in person um, is the most effective tool if you want to convince something somebody of something being able to talk with them in person is so key. So as I talked about, we, we started a petition drive where we looked at uh, 1,600 petition signatures were at the heart of this campaign uh, that really helped to kickstart our uh, engagement, 
create pressure, captured press attention, and started to educate people. Um, you know, people like online petitions. They're easy to click through. But online petitions are just step one. Uh, we want to make sure that we are continually, you know, really working on that uh, ladder of engagement and funneling folks into more and more engagement and ensuring that they're continuing on that pathway to be part of that structure that's building change. Uh, the next piece is we really focused on a, a, a waiver study to really kind of dive in deep. Uh, these Medicaid waiver issues are super complex, um, and even folks who've been studying them for decades uh, still sometimes uh, seem to have issues understanding some key portions. Um, and so we really want to be able to have the tools to make sure we can analyze those um, and deal with those more complex questions. While the majority of people that you work with are going to be, you know, at that point where you can just say, like, we want to end the list, um, you're also going to have folks who are kind of those experts who are going to have way more in-depth and more detailed conversations. Uh, in a couple of different efforts, I've used this tool of having a study that goes back to a one-pager uh, that then goes back to a one-word or one phrase slogan um, that can really help to make sure that you've got people who are just, you know, kind of engaged to those who are very much fully in the effort, really educated and make sure that that messaging is consistent all the way up and down your ladder of engagement. Um, and that base really helps to move you forward. The next piece that we did is uh, uh, a series of presentations. Um, and so, you know, once you have those people sign those petitions, they'll have follow-up emails that will help to give them a little more info. These presentations are kind of that next piece starting to bridge people more towards those more highly engaged experts. Um, and so we did a, uh, a number of them across the state and really helped to break down these complex issues. So then we had parents who have no expertise in, in Medicaid, who could then go to our state's Medicaid director and really walk them through the arguments, walk them through the issues, and make sure that we were actually having substantive discussions. Uh, so it's not just, you know, like me and my team, making sure that we have that movement that is built much larger. Another key piece is hearings. Uh, legislative hearings are tremendous function. Um, you know, they're great because it gives you a good, solid, clear uh, call to action to focus on. Um, for this campaign, we, we focused on some policy proposals that came out of that study um, that really led into those educational presentations. And then those hearings help to educate uh, our, our senator lawmakers and make sure that we were really kind of continuing that effort and that energy. Uh, so, so the experiment that we're going to look at is really kind of diving into, um, for us, you know, one of our key events is our annual dinner. Um, when I took over, it was uh, significantly smaller. Um, we've really grown it by making sure to just kind of follow some basics. Uh, but I wanted to break down those basics in a quantitative fashion and show you what those look like, not only with each individual tool, it's not just about having phone calls, having texts, having email blasts, but what do they all look like together? Because the synergy of them all working together is something greater than any of the individual pieces. So some of those key tools, again, emails, texts, social media, direct mail, phone calls. Um, and back to that ladder of engagement, you know, Phone calls take way more effort. Direct mail takes more cost. Um, you know, social media, email are great, but that only allows you a really kind of surface level sort of engagement. Um, so as we talk about this, I really want to make sure that we're thinking about how do we integrate those old school techniques and new methods. Um, I'm a big fan of David Axelrod. 
um, and his book, Believer. Um, and in that book, he talks about how there are two kind of key types of operatives. There are the old school operatives who, you know, they really kind of operate off of gut feeling and, you know, just kind of their thoughts and their experience. Um, and they're going to be about right about 50% of the time. And then you've got the, the new school folks. And he talked about how in the Obama campaign, it was really those new techie individuals who were focused on making sure that they were really um, bringing that data in to uh, their organizing process and using things like social media and email blasts. Um, so in this, uh, this is when we had a much smaller email list, um, but we had uh, 2,000 emails. Um, of those, 27% were open, 3.61% were clicked. Um, and again, you know, I think we, in that levels of engagement, like it's great, it's nice to hit a whole bunch of people, um, but in terms of your actual sale, um, it's not going to be a lot. But we found that it was really nice for folks to have that in their inbox when they were reminded about the event, whether it was through a phone call or a community event or a text, they'd go back to that email. In the text, we sent out 559 messages. Uh, we got 76 initial responses, 37 who uh, said yes, 42 who said no. Um, and, and that high engagement is just so helpful. If you're not using text blasts, I really suggest you look at adding that to your uh, engagement process. Uh, on social media, you know, having Facebook events is great. Um, I think it's especially helpful for folks as they try and toss it in their calendar. Um, on our event, we had 47 people marked as going, 132 Ooh, marked as Dad! interested. Dada! Dada! Uh, 5,500 who reached. Um, of those, we had 73 Dada. tickets. I'm sorry for my, here's my other assistant, Malachi. <laughs> is um, so then we also use direct mail. And I think these old school techniques and making sure that they're incorporated in are so key. Uh, while direct mail may not have the same sort of power that it used to, I think it still is a tremendous feature that yeah. we really need to um, continue to incorporate in our efforts. Despite the high cost, you get a high level of response um, and you tend to get older folks who um, are actually going to respond. Um, so in terms of your fundraising events, uh, it's something to really keep in mind. Um, I also think one of the great things about direct mail is how much it overlaps with those other tools people need to be reminded of something five to seven times and making sure that you've got those continual reminders can be so powerful. Uh, then calls, um, you know, that yes. more direct engagement again can just be so important. Uh, we didn't have very many calls just because we didn't have a lot of capacity at the time. We had 284 calls. Um, and we saw some huge increase around that time period that we had those calls going out um, that was really effective. Um, it's also really important for sponsorships. Larger level donors uh, aren't going to go and typically support you off of just having uh, a piece of email or, you know, a mailer sent to them, they need to actually be called and personally asked or asked in person. Um, I think really understanding this, we need to, we need to dive into some A-B testing to, to break down the effect more. Um, I already talked a bit about this, but that intersection of the old and new, really, I, none of these tools should be used on their own, they should always be used in coordination. Um, I want to talk about, you know, one of the key kind of shifts that we're seeing societally. Um, the biggest one is using cause as a driver. Um, people don't want to focus on organizations, they want to focus on causes. Uh, I have over on the right, 
uh, a Pew study that shows that there's an increase of individuals who are spiritual but not religious. They don't like the institution of the church, but they do feel so much more, um, you know, really aligned with some sort of spiritual values, but they don't want to focus within that institution and organization that we've seen in the past. Uh, so really focusing on your values-driven propositions and focusing on how do you kind of break things down and bring it back to that individual level is going to be more key than ever. Um, and kind of the, the key phrase um, I always ramble off is, is it digital, timely, and connected? Um, and making sure that you are hitting those folks when they're really thinking about that issue. Um, and that you're grounding it in stories because people care about stories. They don't care about facts and data nearly as much. Um, when you're talking about the, the core of any argument, you've got the ethos, the pathos, and the logos, or, you know, kind of the, the heart, the head, and the gut. And, and it's the heart, you know. It wasn't that I said, hey, look, you can save more money by going and focusing on a more cost-effective uh, pathway towards serving individuals with disabilities. People didn't care about that. They're like, that's great. Okay, Edison, we appreciate that, those facts. Um, and you're going to tell us how to write the bills. Um, but what they really cared about was those families who said, I have to choose in order to make sure that my kid can get the Medicaid to make sure that they get what they need. I can either divorce my husband I can move out of the state or I can give my kid up to foster care. Those sorts of stories hammered home. Um, and they really kind of helped to drive the conversation. Um, I also think it's important that we really look at free content as a driver, um, making sure that you're always producing more information, um, you know, whether that's through a blog or a podcast um getting that information out can help to do a number of things number one really it shows that expertise and that value of here's why my organization matters um as people don't like that organizational sort of structure that we talked about um it shows kind of the value of what having that organizational structure can do um it helps to grow your audience uh, when you have that content on varying issues, you know, that can really help. Um, so for us, that means making sure that people know not only are we interested in issues around Medicaid, we're also interested in civil rights issues like election accessibility or protecting students' rights. Um, it's really good shareable stuff, and especially for social media. I found some of those articles that we've written, blog articles um, and such, can really help to get your message out in a tremendous way. Um, and it's also nice because unlike talking to a reporter, a reporter is going to you know, talk to multiple folks, try and get different sides. Um, with uh, a blog article or a study, you get to master the messaging. You get to say, here's the issue, frame it through your lens and really set the direction and the tone. Um, it also can be helpful for SEO and really making sure that people uh, who are looking for things through a variety of issues, like they're looking for election accessibility. Uh, the Arc of Nebraska disability focused organization may not necessarily be where they go. But when we go and publish a, a study or paper on uh, election accessibility, then we have that added sort of SEO focus. Um, and it also can be really helpful for target areas, making sure that you bring in, in the sort of folks that you're really looking for. Um, another really cool tool that I think can be helpful as we kind of look at these different sort of pathways is making sure that you're leveraging your volunteers in smart ways. So recently, um, what I found is that uh, there were a lot of people who didn't realize all the resources that were out there. Um, and between our 12,000 members, um, tr trying to make sure that people really understood all those resources is hard. Uh, we don't have the staff to really make sure that we can do that. But I went and put out a Google form 
um, that I connected to a sheet um, that allowed me to bring in a whole bunch of information. So each of these dots is a different type of entity that serves people with disabilities. Um, and each of these really helped to engage more people um, by making sure that they knew here are where resources are, here are where you should be looking for things. Um, and then, you know, for families, this means that they have the resources that they need where they need them. Um, then the, the other piece I wanted to talk about is uh, I was able to get 100 one-on-ones with one simple tool, a customized email with a short little script that said, let's get talk, coffee and talk about the future of the ARC. So I went and set up this email blast that was customized to go and say, hey, John, let's get coffee and talk about the future of the ARC, connected it to Calendly, and with one email blast, was able to set up over 100 one-on-one -on -one, uh, meetings with just one simple email blast and 10 minutes of work. Um, so some of the examples of this, you know, I've used our blog, I've used articles through like LinkedIn, um, I've used, uh, you know, independent uh, processes to make sure that we're, we're working with other entities that we're able to link into. Um, and then in terms of talking about what can you do now, um, and just kind of some key things to think about. Um, most of the time when I talk about this, I'm talking to older groups. Um, I think here I've probably got a younger audience, but succession planning is so key. If your organization isn't looking at it, they need to think about how do you move beyond just one dynamic leader and continue to have a pathway forward for the future. Second thing, using bulk email, bulk texting, social media, automated signups uh, helps you to grow from you know, what you're able to do as an individual or even within an organization to really make sure that you can massively scale up quickly. Um, Start posting content. It doesn't have to be perfect. And in fact, I think right now we're in a transition where people want things that seem flawed, that seem human. Uh, I look at TikTok and TikTok is all about really having content that isn't perfect. It's raw, it's human, it's short and concise and can get an issue to really hammer home quickly. Um, and then invest in the future. Um, right now, we are in this huge transition. We're looking at, uh, you know, huge transitions in terms of talent and, and membership. Um, and then financially, we're seeing uh, right now the largest financial tradition, transition in the history of our nation. Um, as we see, you know, that money flowing from baby boomers to uh, Gen X, millennials, um, you really need to be thinking about those gifts and making sure that you're setting yourself up for long-term success. So I really suggest if you haven't started looking at it, look at an endowment. So then you can go and guarantee your programs for a much longer time than just short-term gifts can do. And then last thing, dream big and develop actions. Um, really saying like, here's the big goal here are the pieces that help us to get there. So pivotal um, and making sure that people have those pathways to move forward. So important. With that, I'll uh, stop talking. Um, and uh, here's my email uh, and my website at Elmwood Consulting. Uh, next week, December 14th, I'll have my new book, Sowing the Seeds of Change, the Organizer's Handbook coming out. Um, or if you want to give me a call or text me, please feel free to do so. Um, with that, any questions? Okay. Um, how do you manage not overloading people with a bunch of causes your group may care about? Um, that's a really good question. I think that's really important just because uh, we see such a huge level of burnout, um, especially within the advocacy community. I think people 
um, go and they get started, they start to see an issue uh, that they care about. They see something that they want to engage on. Um, and then they start down a rabbit hole. And I think this happens uh, in party politics too, or you know, really in any sort of situation. People go and they get started. And once you get onto one committee, then all of a sudden people start recruiting you for five similar committees. Um, once you volunteer for one candidate, they're gonna want you to do it for other candidates. Um, and I think making sure we've got that self-reflection can be really important. I think that there are people who, you know, and I think there's a presentation earlier today that talked about that self-care, um, but I think we also need to do volunteer care. Um, and when we have those super volunteers, make sure that they're taking that time to think about themselves, about their families and taking breaks. Um, and then in terms of overloading with that information, I think you just have to scale it down as much as possible um, and make sure that people have options as to how and when they can engage in ways that may make sense for them. And keeping in mind uh, that for everything, there's a time um, and for everything, there's a season and a place. Um, and it may not be that right now is your time. I have one super volunteer who um, has done some amazing stuff, but right now his son is dying um, and in hospice. And he talks to me and tells me, I want to do something. I just can't. I'm like, no, you focus on your son, focus on your life. We'll still be here. Um, but everybody has their time and their place. Uh, the next question I see, uh, how would some of these strategies differ between nonprofits, volunteer groups, local political clubs, and other kinds of organizations? Um, that's a really good question. Um, I think, you know, it, it really depends on the, the individual organization of work for, uh, party, I've worked for individual campaigns, I've worked for nonprofits, churches, um, and I think there's a lot of similarities. I think there are some some key differences. I think for for nonprofits, um, you know, and, and parties, you need to be thinking more about what's going to make the most sense long term and thinking about that ongoing structure. I think for campaigns, a lot of times, I mean, you've got to you've got a solid end deadline of election day. Um, and while you always, I think every campaign I've ever worked with, they want to have that longer term vision. Um, they want to have something that's building beyond just electing one person. Uh, you do have that short term sort of sprint. Um, I think that, you know, trying to kind of build up the long term relational stuff uh, is going to be more important in that um, in those organizations that are going to have that longer life. Um, and think about things, you know, again, about that sustainability. Like, I'm guessing I'm probably one of the few presenters today who has a little assistant with me. Um, but families are important. Organizers have families. Um, and, you know, like, normally my lady would be taking care of them, but it's, you know, we all take our turn. We all work together and making sure that you're looking at a long-term structure is important. Um, that was the next one. What advice can you give to somebody wanting to start in disability advocacy? Um, that's a great question. Uh, there are a number of organizations to look at, you know, your, your local ARC is going to be a great spot to, to check with. Um, each state has a uh, protection and advocacy organization. Typically, it's going to be like a, called disability rights um, that you can work with. Um, also, every university has a university center to really study uh, and provide technical guidance. Um, it's another great place. You've also got organizations like uh, Down Syndrome Congress um, and um, autism partnership that you can really look at. Um, I think, you know, really kind of figuring out what group is, is going to make the most sense for you um, it is going to be important. Um, and I think learning these key tools that, you know, I think you can learn in so many different organizing areas. Like 
I work simultaneously in organizing around renewable energy and agriculture, disability policy, civil rights policy. Um, and as I work in all those sectors, really figuring out how do I go and bring all of those pieces together um, is key, uh, but also, you know, they all have such similar practices. Uh, you know, things like creating a, a study, I've, I've used it in the disability arena and seen the same sort of success using it in the agricultural area. Um, and so I think learning those pieces um, will help you to really uh, get that longer term structure. Um, and, and I think the other thing is just making sure that you're continuing to, to learn and, and build community. Um, what are some ideas you might recommend for smaller orgs or orgs with smaller budgets that don't necessarily have infrastructure yet for operations like scaled email, direct mail, et cetera? Um, got this in a, another PowerPoint and i um, going to plug my book again. Uh, uh, so in the Seeds of Change, an organizer's handbook uh, that will be coming out on Amazon December 14th because I have a chapter where I talk about what it looks like to have a budget for an organization with a $1,000 budget or even for an organization with less than a $100 budget. Um, I think looking at a lot of the free tools out there, um, Google has some amazing tools that you can really leverage, Google Forms. And, uh, ex and Google Sheets are just astounding. Um, and especially if you can pair those up. Um, if you don't have a petition-based sort of tool, you can use a Google Form and Google Sheets to go and give you the same sort of effect. It won't look as pretty and may not have all the same functionality, but can really allow you to quickly put some stuff together. Um, or like that, um, uh, asset mapping process that I showed. I think that can really help to bring bring people quickly together and it can help you to really have a much more digitally distributed organization. Um, and I think that can really have a, a huge impact beyond what a, a much smaller budget can do. Um, I also suggest, you know, looking at looking at tools that there are a number of tools that they may cost some money but they can easily be scaled up. Um, for instance, Nation Builder is a great example of a tool that, you know, their intro level package is like 29 bucks a month, um, which, you know, is pretty cheap. They've got a lot more expensive and a lot nicer packages, but making sure that you've got those tools that help you to scale, um, I think can be so key. Um, and then figuring out what those priorities are. Um, and, you know, maybe there are a lot of softwares like uh, Calendly um, that you can use a free version or you could use the pay version. Or you can look at stuff like uh, Ripple is one of my favorites for creating uh, easy, quick graphics because I am not an artsy person. Um, and that'll help you to make sure that you can do that. And you can do that for free or you can also use their, their paid version. Um, yeah. Anything else? I went kind of quick here. Okay. Yeah. Um, and uh, just uh, dropping my contact info into the chat here real quick. Um, actually, I'm going to just toss it up on the screen. Here's my contact info again. Um, and, uh, hopefully you'll check out my book on Amazon next week. Um, and if you have any questions or um, thoughts or need help with anything, please feel free to reach out to me.